And so tonight we're going to talk about what does the Bible actually say about homosexuality? Because there's a lot of talk about homosexuality and gay marriage and all of that stuff right now. And some people are starting to say that our understanding of the Bible is wrong. That the Bible never condemns homosexuality, just the abuse of it. So we um, are going to start with a brief video of somebody that, that holds this view. And then we're going to talk about what the Bible really does say. We're going to start with a video from a gentleman named Matthew Vines and um, let him explain his uh, view here. He says that the Bible actually says it's not a sin to, be, to live in a homosexual lifestyle. And so uh, we don't have time to play his whole hour-long speech. But I'm going to give you just some brief uh, arguments on what he says uh, the Bible says about homosexuality. Uh, he, says when the, uh, he says when the Bible bans homosexuality, he and, and other people say that the Bible really is not against homosexuality, just the abuse of people by homosexuals. So, um, or in homosexual relationships. It means abusive, exploitative pra uh, practices, but not loving homosexual unions. That's one of the arguments that he and people like him make. God made me a homosexual, and it would be against his creation of me for me to marry a person of the opposite sex. He says this clearly in his video. And finally, he says, God said it's not good for man to be alone, so he must want me to be with a person of the same sex. Because God, you know, God in the creation... A narrative in Genesis says, you know, makes Adam and says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make somebody a suitable helper for, to be with him, to be his companion. And he makes the first woman. And so his reasoning is, well, if God knew it wasn't good for me to be alone and God made me gay, then I should be married to another man. And so we need to look at this. Because, well, number one, you do want to be careful that we don't just out of hand throw an, an idea out and say, oh, well, there's, that's just wrong. We want to actually think about it and look at it. What does the Bible actually say about homosexuality? And so to start with, you have to go with, back to God's plan for sex. Now, I know this probably seems weird that we're talking about sex in church, especially if you're your first week here. Um, <laughs> sorry, Lindsay, but... We want to be honest and open with, with what does the Bible actually teach. And so it says, The Lord God fashioned, in, uh, fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, Adam, and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become <coughs> one flesh. Now, one flesh here, in the Hebrew, it's a euphemism for sex. <laughs> They'll be joined together. I know, and some people are blushing right now, and I know, it's a little <laughs> awkward. You're in church, and we're talking about sex. But, it's true. It's what the Bible actually says, and I'm not going to hide the truth of God's word. So, this is God's plan for sex. You have to start with, what was God's ideal? What was his plan for this? And it's all it's about a life change. Notice the man leaves mom and dad, leaves from one family to start a new family with a wife. And it's very specific. It's not with another man. It's not two <coughs> women together. This is God's plan. Now, interestingly, Jesus quotes this again in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. Exact quote. Now, that context was in divorce. Somebody asked him, good teacher, what do you say about divorce? And so he says, well, this is God's plan. Divorce was never part of God's plan. The two are joined together. Don't, and Jesus adds, and what God, you know, don't, that they shouldn't be separated. That divorce shouldn't happen. And uh, we know in a fallen world in which we live that divorce does happen. And it is sad thing, but it is not and was not ever God's plan for marriage. Now, here's the ban. God says, 
clearly in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. And there are many things in the Old Testament that are called an abomination. It's called an abomination to eat shellfish. It's also called an abomination, as I recall, to have clothes that were made of, say, cotton and linen mixed together. Those were rules that God gave to the people of Israel for them to follow because they were to be his unique people. And they were to be a witness to the world that God was different than him. In the context of this chapter here, the whole chapter is about sex and who not to have sex with. And so it says, don't have sexual relations with any close relative, either by blood or by marriage. I'm, you know, kind of uh, um, giving a summary here real quickly. Don't offer your children as a burnt offering to Molech. This is something that they used to do. I, I, as a dad, I can't even imagine. Oh, we had a kid. We should offer this child in fire, burn it to death for the god Molech. This is part of, so this is another thing that God hates. Uh, don't have sex with animals. Um, don't have homosexual relations. The reason I'm telling you guys this is I want you to understand, this is a whole chapter about evil forms of sex, things that God says don't do. Now, we're going to come back to this a little bit later on in the night, but I want you to keep that in mind. <laughs> And this same ban is repeated in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. If you want to uh, check it out sometime, twice it says, don't lie with a man as one lies with a woman. In fact, in Leviticus 20, 13, it actually even says, if someone does that in the community in Israel, they should be put to death by throwing rocks at their head until they die. So it, it says this totally clearly. If a man lies with a man, as a man lies with a woman, again, lies with... This is another one of those biblical euphemisms for what? Sex. Sex, yes. So this is homosexuality, clear as a bell. I know this is embarrassing. I know this is hard, girl. I know, it's just plain. But I'm, I'm trying to be true to the Bible here. Matthew Vines makes the argument that Leviticus, because there's the, the bans on shellfish and all that other stuff in the book of Leviticus, he says... These laws have never been followed by Christians. But he's partially right. Like you and I, uh, we can make, wear clothes that are mixed, like polyester and cotton or whatever kind of, I don't even know if they blend those. But anyhow, um, well, we can eat shellfish and pig and other things that were said not to eat in the Old Testament. And I'll explain why a little bit later. But I want to show you also that this ban isn't just stated in the Old Testament, it's restated in the New Testament. In the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 25 and 30, says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Now, notice the they's here, they and them. This is a cultural-wide thing. This is a group of people that as a whole say, you know, there is no God. Or... Our God it lives in this tree, or our God is this cow. They deny the true God of heaven, and they worship other things. So he, he says they, they knew God, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. This is not a good term. Degrading means to make something of less value or make something unclean. This is to go roll around in the pigsty with all the mud and the pig feces and urine. This is, that's the picture of this word degrading. With degrading passions. For the women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. Once again in context, natural function means natural, natural sexual function. The way God designed man and woman together. Um, for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandon the natural function of the woman. Here's how we, we know for sure what it's talking about. And burden their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts, receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And just as they did not see... Now, let me back up here for a second. Notice this. There's a group of people or groups of people, cultures throughout time, that God has punished. And one of the punishments is, so, oh yeah, you want to do that? Here. 
I will I will turn you over to degrading yourselves to shaming yourselves to do what ought not to be done as a punishment from God and when you read this in context it's pretty clear and he goes on and he says and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer God gave them over to a depraved mind the idea is a mind, well, you guys probably see this at lunch at your school sometimes. Yeah. People that just have a mind that just, it's always sick, it's always nasty. <laughs> it's always gross. Well, God says that sort of thing, and he goes on and says, to do things which are not proper, things that are just sick. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy. <coughs> Murder, strife, deceit, malice, they're gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, which always intrigues me. Like, this is a whole list of sins. It starts with women <coughs> having sex with women, men having sex with men, and then all this other stuff that God hates, that is not right to do. Wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. Malice is deep-seated, burning hatred. Gossips. Boy, do we see that today. Slanders. Trying to ruin somebody's reputation by lying about them. Hmm. That never happens at school, right? <laughs> Ever. No. 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 Not at all. Yeah. Inventors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Inventors of evil. God says, you guys dream up new ways of being horrible. Of, of disobeying God. It's it's scary, but it's true. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, they're untrustworthy, they're unloving, they're unmerciful. All things that God values, trustworthiness, lovingness, or being loving, merciful. These are all traits that God wants for you and me to have. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And I read this whole section, and if you watched all of Matthew Vine's hour-long thing, he just talks about a couple of little words here, and he leaves out the rest of the context. And it says right there, those who practice any of these things are worthy of death. So, from that, knowing it's talking clearly about homosexuality, how can you end up saying, like he does, that homosexuality isn't a sin? In context, when you look at the whole, what he does is he just takes little itty bitty pieces here, a little piece here, and he ignores the context where they fit in. And when you look at the context, this is a judgment of God against a group of people who've denied who God is. And they give hearty approval to other people to do the same. And I just see in Matthew Vines and all of the other people who are saying it's okay to be gay and be a Christian, they're giving hearty approval to disobey God and disobey the Bible. Because the problem is the two don't mix. There's just no way to be true to the Bible and to say that God in the Bible says homosexuality is okay. And so our first point to live by is that both the New and the Old Testament condemn any sexual contact other than between a married man and his wife. And one of the things that I always want to be careful of is people do say, you know, you Christians, you get bent all, all bent out of shape about homosexuality. And I, I say, yeah, they're right. Because God says any sex before marriage is sin too. Any sex after you're married with someone other than your wife is sin. Why? Because God designed a man and a woman to come together, to have a family, to have kids, and to be faithful to each other for their whole life. That's God's plan. Remember, we started with God's plan back in the book of Genesis. Oh, here's the span. Matthew Vines says, one of his arguments, and many other people, I'm just using him because he's a video of, because he's got videos out and he's trying to promote this actively with his organization, but there's many other people that say the same thing. He says that Leviticus, all the laws in Leviticus don't apply to anybody other than the Jews. So we're going to look in context, same place here in Leviticus, 
chapter 18, verses 24 and 25. Remember, Leviticus chapter 18 talks about all these sexual practices that are evil, one of which is a man lies with a man as a man lies with a woman. Matthew Vines says that doesn't apply to anybody but Jews. And even in the chapter that Matthew Vines is quoting, it says here, Do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all of these things the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. God says, you know, the people of Israel, God walked them out of, uh, out of Egypt and slavery, and then they disobeyed God and wandered around the desert for 40 years, and finally he takes them into the land of Canaan. He says, there are these wicked people groups living in Canaan, and I'm going to chase them out of the land. Why? Because they're living in the ways, all those things. Sex with close relatives, sex with animals, homosexuality, offering their children to Molech, all of these wicked practices of the land, these people that are not Jews are going to get kicked out of the land of Canaan because of these sins. He says, for the land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. I'm sorry, but Matthew Vine's argument and the argument of people like him falls completely on its face even in chapter 18. You just look at the context and you find out these are moral principles of the God of heaven for all people and all time. They're not changing. And to do what he and other people do, you have to be untrue to the scriptures. You have to tear little bits and pieces out here and there and tell people, well, don't read the rest of the chapter. Well, yeah, read the rest of the chapter. Find out what it, the chapter is really all about, not just what little piece you pulled out. And I want to show you, to further prove this point, that these laws still apply to us as Christians. And uh, maybe this will kind of make some sense out of why we can wear mixed clothes, but homosexuality is a sin. Why we can eat shellfish or pig, but... Sex, out, oh, sex with close relatives is a sin. We'll see that here in the, just a minute. This is the update to the span. This is how broad God's commandment is. This is Acts chapter 15, verses 28 and 29. Context is always important. And you can go home and read this for yourself and see if I'm telling you the truth. But the background of Acts chapter 15 is Jesus was a Jew, lived in Israel, and he told the Jewish people about how to be forgiven for their sins. And then he told his disciples, his followers, his crew, when I'm gone, I want you to take this message to the whole world. So they start taking it to what are known as Gentiles. That just means anybody that's not a Jew. So that's most of us in the room, because I don't think any of you guys are Jewish. Um, and so they go out and they start converting people that aren't Jews. And they don't live by the dietary laws of the Bible. They don't live by any of the Bible, really, for the most part. Um, or, or they live by very little of the Bible. And so there's this big debate. There are some people, Jewish Christians, that are trying to follow Jesus that say, oh wait, everybody, everybody who wants to follow Jesus has to obey the law that God gave to Moses. The Ten Commandments and all the dietary laws, all the stuff in Leviticus, don't eat shellfish and don't wear clothes of two types of cloth and all this other stuff. You have to follow all that. There's another group of people headed up by a guy named Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He said, no, God has freed us from the law in Jesus Christ. So that's the background to this argument. They have this big convention. They call as many leaders in the church as possible, and they get together and they talk about it, and they argue about it, and they pray about it, and they talk about it, and pray about it, and uh, they finally make a decision for everybody, all Christians, for all time. And this is their decision. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you, the Gentile Christians, non-Jews, who have never lived by the Jewish law code, lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols. It was not uncommon in the Greco-Roman time to have all of the meat taken to the local temple, and there a priest would slaughter the, the cow, the pig, whatever, 
and then it would be sacrificed to their god, and the meat would be cut off and sold at the marketplace. And Or you could go and eat at the temple and eat things that were sacrificed to idols. So that's why this is important. Food sacrificed to idols, to eat blood, and things that are strangled. Don't want to eat blood because the Bible says life is in the blood. Scientifically now we've, we know that. As soon as you drain blood out, the person's dead. We know that George Washington, our first president, died because they believed that there was bad blood in his veins, and this was common practice, so they bled him many times until he had so little blood left. He was sick, and so the sickness contributed to his death. But we know that life is in the blood. That's why God says don't drink blood. Don't, don't eat something that was strangled because the blood stays in the meat then. And from fornication. Now, the Greek word here is porneia. And this Greek word porneia, the more I studied it, I've become convinced that it means a wide range of sexual sin. It covers everything. So what it says is, you and I have to live by the laws put forth in Leviticus chapter 18. No sex with close relatives. No sex with, you know, people that you're, or family by marriage. No sex with person of the same sex. And see, when you start to study the Bible for what it truly says, you can see that all of these people that are saying it's okay to be gay and be a Christian are ignoring huge parts of the Bible, important parts of the Bible. And to me, that's a little scary. And that scares me because the Bible is God's word, and the Bible is the textbook by which we will be judged on Judgment Day. And people are lying to others about the Bible. Saying, oh, don't worry, that won't be on the test. Yes, it will. And God cares dearly about how we live in this life. So, I mean, notice that. No sexual sin. That word porneia should be familiar to you and me because there's an English word that sounds a lot like it. You don't need to say it. I think we're good. Okay. No, I think some people probably no, haven't gotten no, it. No, no, I think no. we're good. Okay, plug your ears real quick. The word pornography in English comes from the word porneia in Greek. I know it's uncomfortable. Just breathe. It's okay. See, guys, the Bible is a lot more detailed. And, and actually, I remember one of my professors telling me that the Old Testament, he's like, whew, when you learn the Hebrew of the Old Testament, it is so like painfully open about all kinds of things that <laughs> it's just, he's like, our English translations of the Bible have kind of neatly covered over a lot of the stuff that's so blatantly obvious in the Old Testament. And in some ways, we do that to our own detriment, because I want to know what God really says. Because if he's going to judge me by what he said, I want to know it so I can live it. And I want you guys to know it so you can live it. And I want everybody I know to know the Bible so they can live it out. So they can come to know God, so they can be forgiven of their sins and not face eternity in the lake of fire. So our second point to live by, this ban on any sex outside of biblical marriage is not just for the Old Testament Jews, but for all people, for all time. We saw that clearly, Leviticus chapter 18, the end of it says, the land of Canaan spit these people out, at God's behest, because he's in charge, because of their sexual sin. And they burned their children Molech, which is just unbelievable. I, I still struggle, but that's that's what they, I know. But that's what they did. Well, you know, in all honesty, we like to judge them. But I look at our country, and we have well, we have abortion. And we've killed fifty million babies, and we offer those babies on the idol on the the altar of our convenience, our mental health. I'm not ready for babies, and so it's easy to judge, and yet. 
look at our culture and in some ways we're just as sick. And it saddens me. But this ban applies to all people through all time. <coughs> Whether it's the ancient people in the land of Canaan that got kicked out because of the wicked things they did, or the people in America today, God and his moral standards have not changed at all. Okay, so I know tonight is going to be a long lesson, so I put in a slide that says intermission, because we're going we're gonna to look at some videos about this subject now. And the first one is dealing with what's commonly stated by homosexuals, which is, well, God made me this way. So, if God made me this way, it would be, Matthew Vine says this, it would be against my nature for me to be heterosexual if God made me homosexual. So, let's see. This video, this is a, a segment from 60 Minutes about uh, just uh, things that relate to what we're talking about right here. Yeah, you should feel confused, because here's the, here's the reason we showed this video. We really don't know 100%. Now, this video, the scientists totally deny that it has anything to do with life experience or what's called nurture, how mom treats you, how dad treats you, is dad distant. I'm sorry, but there are studies that have shown a connection between those things. So, there's this whole soup, this whole, you know, m mess of stuff that goes into a person's identity and their sexual orientation. And so you get told all the time, well, it's genetic. We know it's genetic. God made me this way. Through my genes, I had no choice in the matter. Therefore, you have to stop telling me it's a sin to be homosexual. Well, science doesn't even back that up. Because studies have shown that if you are twins, twin boys who are um, uh, identical twins. One study said there's a 43% chance if one twin is gay, the other will be. Another study said it, there's a 52% chance if one twin is gay, the other will be as well. But their genes are identical. Their DNA is the same. So if it was DNA, it would be 100%. You'd either have a set of gay twins or they'd both be straight. So it's not just genes. It's not just your DNA. It's all kinds of things together. Now, what does this mean? What's the takeaway from this? Well, it is that um, God didn't make anyone homosexual. Living life in a fallen world makes people, uh, causes us to live in ways other than what God has in mind. They've also found that there is a genetic element to depression a genetic element to schizophrenia. There is a genetic connection or a family connection where if you have a relative who's an alcoholic, you're at a much greater risk for becoming an alcoholic yourself. It's like, well, what? Wait, why? But the thing is, those are... Um, God commands us to live in the joy of the Spirit. He commands us not to be drunk with wine. Um, but those are all examples of we live life in a fallen world. We live life in a DNA, you know, in, in, a, in an environment where our DNA is actually not getting better. Some scientists have studied this and say we're actually not getting smarter as humans, like evolutionists would tell us. We're actually getting dumber. You look at our founding fathers, many of them spoke four languages. They were brilliant thinkers. <laughs> it's like, um... Yeah, we're not doing so good. So, now some of that can be training, but the, the point is, number one, those who tell you, oh, it's just genetics, it's not my fault, I didn't make this choice. Well, it's not just genetics. There's a whole bunch of things that go into it. But the overarching thing that goes into it is we live in a fallen world. Each one of us has tendencies in our genes, ten tendencies we picked up from our parents, but that doesn't excuse us or give us a reason not to obey the Bible. This next video is very interesting, and this has to do with the why. Why would God say it's bad 
to be a homosexual, bad to practice homosexuality. I mean, he knew that sin was going to do this, that someday people would be homosexuals. That's why he said don't do that. So why is he being so mean? Why is he being so heartless? And this video goes to the heart of that issue, that it's actually because God loves human beings that he says don't live that way. It's pretty astounding to hear what they're saying. Three different studies, three different parts of the world, the one up in Canada says you lose between 8 and 20 years of your life. The one in America says you lose between 20 and 24 years of your life. The one in Denmark says you lose between 20 and 25 years of your life. Being a homosexual is more damaging to you physically, to your body, than smoking. And this is going to get a lot of people angry probably get lots of comments and negative, you know, homophobia and all kinds of things thrown at me when I put this on YouTube. The problem is, this is reality. Now, one thing I should point out, all three of these studies were done uh, back in the 90s, and they were saying, uh, I've seen some people say, and possibly rightly so, that treatments for AIDS have gotten better, so homosexuals are living longer now, even if they get AIDS, it's not an immediate death sentence, which you the studies were done mid-90s uh, and published late 90s, most of them. I haven't seen any more studies on this, I, I think because it's so unpopular that it's kind of the truth that the rest of the world doesn't want to face. But whether it's 10 years of life lost or 20 years, <clears throat> the reality of the situation is that your friends today at school who are saying, I'm a lesbian, I'm a homosexual, they, by beginning to act on that, will shorten their lifespan significantly. And if you look into studies of lesbians, uh, they are the one of the most at-risk groups for intimate partner violence. The safest that you can be as a woman is to be married in a committed relationship. I, I couldn't find the study again, but I saw this study and said it was like a 0.73% of women who are married are abused by their husband. And it's, it was like 11 or 15% of lesbians are abused by their lesbian lover. The incidents of murder are statistically more frequent, and these are, this is just real life. Somehow, when lesbians are living together, they're causing increased risk of cancer. And when two men are living together and having sex together, it causes all kinds of increased risk of cancer, all kinds of health problems. I don't want to go into too much detail, because it's already hard enough to hear some of this stuff. But suffice it to say, the medical evidence, when you really look into it, is stark and is really scary. It is one of the worst things that you can do to your body is to live the homosexual lifestyle long term. And all of a sudden now it starts to make sense why God says don't do that. Don't do this to yourselves, do this to each other, because you're killing yourselves. So our next point to live by is, God does know best, is working for our best, even when he commands us not to live a homosexual lifestyle, and maybe I should say, especially when he says that. I mean, because the Bible tells us not to do all kinds of things. In the Old Testament, he said not to eat pig. We now know that if you don't cook pig hot enough, get it hot enough, you can get this disease called trichinosis, and it's really nasty, and the worms get in your heart and kill you. Uh, it's really gross. Um, and that's why God says don't eat pig. We now can cook pig safely so we can eat it without fear. God, but we see time and again God protects us in the Bible. The Bible actually says not to take drugs. And we can see, you guys see what crystal meth does to people. You guys have probably seen those crystal faces of crystal meth on YouTube. 
God loves people. And God wants to protect people from hurting each other. Do you know that a life, the lifespan of someone, a man and a woman who are married is longer than a man or a woman who live apart their whole life? Doing it God's way, living life God's way, blesses a person in the long run. Now these are statistics, and not everybody is guaranteed they'll live until 95, but on the whole, you look at it, it's just amazingly clear. Do it God's way, live a longer life. Do it man's way, live a shorter life, suffer more, hurt more, hurt others more, die sooner. Can't be more clear than this. You know, keep in mind, guys, that God's plan, he made the first couple, he made them heterosexual. That was his design. I know it's pretty crazy when you think God is the one who came up with sex. And you see how our society treats sex, and it's not the way God designed it, that's for sure. But it still is his plan. And so it doesn't matter what kind of temptation is knocking at the door of your heart, whether it's homosexuality or, this is a big one, I see a lot of people struggle with this one, and especially you girls, worshiping the idea of romance. I see people that grew up in the church and profess themselves to be Christians, and they end up dating and eventually marrying somebody who's not a Christian. And the Bible clearly says, don't do that to yourselves. And then they live the rest of their life struggling with the consequences of their decision to go outside of God's plan. But we also see people that are making an idol out of fame that will sell their soul to get famous, to get rich, to become powerful. God says, don't, don't do that. Don't waste your life. Don't destroy your life. So this last video here is, is by a guy named Robbie Zacharias. And he had, the background for this is there was a reporter from Nightline who was coming to watch him in one of his presentations. He goes around the whole country, the whole world, and talks to people in colleges. He gives a talk, and then he does a question and answer segment. This woman was coming and saying, what about, you know, I have great respect for Christianity because you guys said and, and still say, and you guys were part of the hearts of the civil rights movement. A lot of civil rights leaders were pastors, both African American and white pastors, because they said, this is not, a, this is not in the Bible. We shouldn't be racist. She said, I have great respect for you because of that. But then it comes to homosexuality, and you still say it's sin and it's wrong and you shouldn't practice it. And their people too, shouldn't they have the same respect as a person of a different race? And so Ravi Zacharias answers this woman's question. I have to correct Ravi in one thing. He says, sometimes we renounce our dispositions. And I say, all of us have to renounce our dispositions for the sake of Christ. Because we are born selfish. You know, my cute, adorable little daughter named Faith, she is selfish, even at 18 months, 17 months right now. Okay, so she loves to talk to me on the phone. She just loves to talk on the phone, basically. She doesn't really care who's on the other end. So, I called home the other day, and I had to talk to my wife, and she was like, you know, we need to do this, and what about that? And I hear in the background, ah! And then Shelly's like, Faith really wants to talk on the phone right now. I was like, well, we got to finish talking about this. Faith, and Shelly goes, oh, great. Now she's throwing a temper tantrum. She's on the floor kicking and screaming. She's 17 months old. Who taught her to be so selfish? It's our fallen human nature. It's in each one of us. So we all have to renounce our nature for the cause of Jesus Christ because we are all selfish. Me comes first all the time. <laughs> And that's the same in each of our hearts. God commands us to pick up our cross daily, to die to ourselves, to follow Him. Whether that means that I don't live a homosexual lifestyle, or I don't look at pornography, or I don't, uh, you know, fill my mind with garbage, or I don't, uh, you know, I mean, there's a whole list. I don't make me the center of my universe. You know, all of these things, God commands us to change our uh, way of living to line up with the Bible, with His command. 
But otherwise, you know, Robbie is right. Sex is something that God created. God created it to be good, and it is sacred. And in our society, we use sex or sexuality to sell everything from cars to food. To, it's just disgusting. It's really sad because that's not how God designed it. Our next point to live by is our maleness or our femaleness is a sacred design by God. God made us that, the way we are. Now, the fall has impacted us. Remember, God said to the man, you're going to live by the sweat of your brow. Thorns and thistles are going to grow up. It's going to make it hard for you to eat. You screwed up. Your life just got harder. And God says to the woman, a different punishment. You sinned, and now I'm going to greatly increase your pain in childbirth. Yeah. You know the amazing thing is? I see this all the time. If you ever watch an animal give birth, it's just kind of like, eh, plop, there it is, it's all done. And then I see my wife give birth, and it's screaming and yelling and writhing in pain and three weeks of recuperation. And, and you know, we have three beautiful kids as a result. But I just see, you know, God said I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. And anybody who's ever seen a human give birth knows that that is true. But our, our maleness, the way God made a man, the way God made a woman is sacred. It was his plan. It has been marred. It has been deformed by the fall. We suffer the consequences of sin all the time. But there still is that, that hint, that plan behind the scenes. God made it special. Made us with a purpose in mind. Now, we're going to go back into the Bible verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 is where we're going to start. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the immoral person. Uh-oh, wait a second. Not to associate. I did not mean at all, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or swindlers, or idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. We'd all have to live in monasteries. Because you couldn't eat lunch at school if you couldn't associate with the immoral people. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's true. You guys know it's true, because I know it's true, because we all have been there. <laughs> but he's saying here, remember at the end of Matthew Vine's little video clip, clip we played with the little stick figure out on the bench in front of the church because he got kicked out because he's gay, and how mean and horrible that is? It comes from the Bible itself. Paul says the person that's living in sexual immorality, don't associate with them. Don't even eat with them. Because God calls Christians to be holy people. To love God above our own proclivities, as Ravi Zacharias would say. To make God more important than any lifestyle decision, than any desire I may have. So, you know, it's it, on a human level. Over the years, I have had homosexual friends, people that I care deeply about. And whenever I had opportunity, I took opportunity to challenge them and say, you know, this isn't God's design for you. You know that I care about you as a person. But the Bible says, don't live this way. And that's what Paul's saying here. That's what we should be doing with those who are living an openly homosexual lifestyle or those who are in the closet or, you know, who are struggling. We should say, hey, don't go down that path. God says no. Don't build that pattern into your life. In, in Paul, back to Paul here, verse 11. But I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, Christian in other words, if he is an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. There's a whole list. It isn't just homosexuality, but somebody who's an alcoholic who just gets drunk all the time, who's a, who's a, a thief, who rips people off, who worships idols, immoral person. Um, it, 
you know, I mean, he says, these people shouldn't be in church unless they're repenting, unless they're trying to change. If they're coming to church and going, hey, this is me, <laughs> Jesus loves me, God has mercy, uh, no, there's a problem. Notice that even Paul says there's a problem because he says they're so-called brothers. The Bible says that you and I are the family of, Christ, of God. And therefore, you know, the, the term brother is just another way of saying Christian in the Bible. Or the way that we would call people Christians today. For what I have, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Oh, we hear this all the time. Oh, Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. Wait, it's God's job to judge outsiders. But Paul said the leadership of the church has to judge sin in people in the church. Even to the point where somebody who refuses to repent of sin will get kicked out. Why? With the hope that they'll repent and go, you know what? My sin got me kicked out of my church community. Maybe I should leave my sin and obey the Bible. It, it is really clear in the Bible. Homosexuality is sexual sin. It falls in a broad category with lots of other sexual sins. The Bible says those who profess to be Christians and yet are gay, we shouldn't even, are, are living in sexual sin, whether it's homosexuality or living together with a girlfriend or a uh, boyfriend. Uh, who's a drunkard, a rip-off artist, we shouldn't even eat with these people. They should not be in church with us until they repent. Or unless they repent. It's clear. It's sad, but it's the truth of God's word, and I dare not change it. And I have to stand up when I see people like Matthew Vines running around saying, Oh, we've misunderstood the Bible. No, we have not. It is painfully clear in the Bible that this is sin. Now, I don't want to ever leave somebody with no hope. Because here's the deal. If, if once we sinned once, we were stuck in sin the rest of our lives, there'd be no hope for any of us. But God can change a person's life. Even a person who's living as a homosexual, or a person who's sleeping around, or a person who's doing drugs, or getting drunk all the time. God is in the business of changing people's hearts and lives if they'll truly follow Him. And here's the story of a guy who's now teaching at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, where I went to seminary. And he's a guy that God has gotten a hold of his heart and changed his life. So I don't ever want to end a lesson like this on something that is so important without giving the biblical hope. The, the thing is that there is hope, and we'll see that in the end of this verse, but one more time, Paul makes it painfully clear that living in a life of sin, whether it's homosexual sin or heterosexual sin or greed or all sorts of evil, is not acceptable to God. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. And this is one of those areas that... Uh, that Matthew Vines likes to say, and uh, several other people try to claim that we don't even know for sure what these words mean, but I want to show you the, the Greek words behind effeminate here. And so the Greek word behind that is malakos. In this case, the word in the text is malakoi, referring to a person who is soft, effeminate, the passive male partner in a homosexual act, a male prostitute, or a boy kept for homosexual relations with a man. It's pretty clear what's going on here is talking about homosexuality. Now, you can try to say, well, it's just abuse of homosexuality, it's just prostitution, or uh, male prostitution for homosexuality, or uh, boys kept for sex with older men, which 
both are gross and I would I would agree those are evil but when you look into the commentaries the database of biblical languages it clearly says the first one is the passive male partner in a homosexual act and it, it just you can try to twist this word you can try to make excuses but as we've seen throughout the lesson tonight the way of biblical evidence against homosexuality being acceptable to God, being even blessed by God, is so overwhelming that only those who have a hard heart are those whose minds have been blinded by the refusal to turn from sin could continue to hold this view. The second word there, homosexuals, it comes, it's a compound word. Our sinicoite is the word in the actual uh, text here. Arson is Greek for man. Koites is marriage bed. Interestingly, in Leviticus where it says, you not, shall not lie with a man as a man lies with a woman. There is a, the Greek translation of the Bible, which uh, many of the biblical authors used in their citations when they were writing the New Testament in Greek. That translation uses the word arson in koite, or, um, koites, in its translation of the ban on homosexuality. Those are the words, a man shall not lie with a man as a man lies with a woman. These are the exact words used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. These are the exact words used. And now Paul reiterates those words again. He puts them together. There's evidence of one other uh, possible use of this word that might predate Paul, but the the dating on it is so iffy, we can't say if it was 200 years before Paul wrote this or 200 years after. And even if we could say that, we couldn't even prove for sure that Paul had known this obscure source. So, uh, leave it at this. It's possible that Paul just combines these two words um, because he has studied the Septuagint. He knows that the, the Jewish readers who read this will look at this and go, hey, that sounds exactly like Leviticus chapter 18, where it says a man shall not lie with a man. And the point is, overall, this word is totally clear. It is about homosexual relations. It is not just about abusive or exploitative homosexual relations. This section bans homosexuality, says that those who practice such things will not be in hell. 1 Corinthians, also written by Paul, chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? No heaven in their future, the lake of fire coming for them. Do not be, de be deceived, neither fornicators, that's that word pornea again, uh, pornos, those who practice sexual sin, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, nor homosexuals nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Totally clear. So there is no such thing as a gay Christian. Somebody living an openly gay lifestyle who's not convicted of their sin, who's not turning to Jesus and turning away from their sin, is not a true believer in Jesus Christ. But, here's the hope, because such were some of you. Paul says, yes, but you can be saved from that. You don't have to live in that. You don't have to end up in the lake of fire for eternity because of how you used to live. But you can't live that way anymore. He goes on and says, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, means set apart for God's purposes. But you were justified, made right before God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God anyone. If we turn to Jesus and repent of our sin, we can be forgiven and we can go to heaven, but we cannot continue to live in sin. It's just completely antithetical to Christianity and to the Bible. And you and I need to spend the rest of our lives getting the sin out of our getting rid of our own proclivities to worship romance, to worship wealth, to worship fame, to worship whatever it is that gets our attention away from God and how he says to live. And so I, I know it's been a long, 
long night here, long message, but I, I hope you guys are encouraged. I hope you're also challenged because people that are being told these lies, <coughs> these mis misstatements from the Bible that Matthew Vines is saying, they need to hear the truth because they're going to have to answer to God one day. You and I need to face the truth. We're going to answer to God one day. We better be living by the Bible, not just living however we feel like. The Bible says that you and I are God's ambassadors, as if God is making his appeal to mankind through us. I want to challenge you. Live that out. <coughs> you and I should be appealing to our friends, whether they're gay or straight or drinking or partying or sleeping around or, or seem to be good people but don't know God, for them to come to know him to live their lives for Him, to change who they are for Him, because they love Him.